uh, meeting of the State Transportation Board to order. Welcome, everybody. Invocation. Okay, so my invocation guy is not here today. Um, so I'm going to do it. And um, let's see. I just thought about this this morning, so kind of bear with me a little bit. Um, you know, I've got a, a very good friend who's a rabbi. And, you know, um, in the September, October period every year, the Jewish religion uh, recognizes its um, most religious period, a couple of holidays called Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And at that time, you know, if, if, if a Jew doesn't go to synagogue much during the year, that's the time they show up. And the rabbis are responsible for giving their, their sermons. Um, and it's a big deal. They have to think long and hard about what they're going to say. And my friend and I, uh, our rabbi, would, would sit down every year right before the spirit of time and talk about what I wanted him to say. He never actually said any of those things. But, um, but I always thought it would be really neat to, to have the opportunity to, to give a sermon. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to give a sermon. Um, but I am going to take um, a couple of minutes to reflect on something. And that is that it's election season. And don't worry, I'm not going to get political. I'm just reflecting that it's election season, and sadly, election season these days in America reflects a period of great disharmony and antagonism and everything that is unfortunately upsetting about America. But let's face it, this is still the greatest country in the world. I moved here 42 years ago, absolutely thrilled to death to have the opportunity to be an American. And at this time, I thought it would be nice, it would be good, it would be appropriate two and a half weeks before election season, rather than reflect on the antagonisms that we, we feel because we're inundated with these commercials and messages that make us separate ourselves, our, our families, our friends, our colleagues, and reflect on the fact that as Americans, we actually do have more that unites us than what actually separates us and that the greatness of our country is the fact that we do have free and fair elections and an opportunity to elect our leaders and perpetuate you know, everything that is right and wonderful about this country. And so for my invocation, I'd like to say, dear God, thank you. Thank you for our freedom, for our democracy, for our opportunities, for our opportunity to pursue uh, happiness and, and, and everything that we have in this country, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now I get the podium yet again. <laughs> roll call. Roll call. I missed the roll call. Please. Um, okay, we'll start with uh, Congressional District 1, Ms. Purcell. Present. Two, Mr. Floyd. Present. Three, Mr. Bucketire. Present. Four, Mr. Brown. Present. Five, Ms. Key. Present. Six, Mr. Abel. Seven, Mr. Bowen. Present. Eight, Mr. Golden. Here. Nine, Ms. Dunn. Present. Ten, Mr. Basel. Here. Eleven, Mr. Lewis. Twelve, Mr. Morris. Here. Thirteen, Ms. Lemon. And fourteen, Mr. Sharon. Okay, well, welcome again to the State Transportation Board meeting. I want to reflect for just a minute or, or share with you um, for just a minute uh, that yesterday uh, the board uh, members were invited to uh, tour the OMAT facility. OMAT is the Office of Materials and Testing for uh, the Georgia Department of Transportation located down in Forest Park. and. Um, Mr. Patrick Allen um, hosted us, him and um, tremendous uh, number of staff members there with, with, with great um, enthusiasm and, and 
um, information just really just delighted us with um, presentations of everything, or at least portions of what they do down at OMAT um, to ensure um, that the roads that um, Georgians drive on um, are safe and, and tested and meet the qualifications and standards um, that GDOT sets. We, we saw um, um, equipment that does what's called non-destructive testing, which is um, essentially what it sounds like. It, it, it doesn't touch anything. It shoots radar and, 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 and light waves and radio waves um, at surfaces um, and, and provides information that can then, you know, verify, you know, density and strength and, and quality. And then there's the, the more fun part, which is the destructive testing. And we got to see, um, you know, 60 pound uh, concrete cylinders smashed, you know, after they reach a certain, you know, pounds per square inch force um, that is that is acceptable. And my favorite was 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 this. I've got a I've got a take home toy. Um, I'm going to stand up and share this. You know, this was a steel rod that was two inches shorter than it is now, and it was put into a machine like this and then pulled from both ends as we watched. And, you know, for the nerdy guys like me in the room, you know, who are just fascinated to watch a, what is this, one inch or more? More, more than one inch steel rod snap in half, notably after the amount of pressure um, and tensile strength required by GDOT standards. And nevertheless, I just wanted to share, you know, that, you know, it is, it is tremendously gratifying as members of the board to learn about you know, various aspects of the Georgia Department of Transportation. They, they, there's just so much out there that's happening in this, in this wonderful organization. And I just wanted to you know, say kudos and, and thanks to Patrick and the rest of the team um, for hosting us and for the tremendous work that they do. So with that, welcome. And it is time to approve the minutes from the September board meeting. Um, is there a motion to approve? I move to approve the minutes. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Robert. Um, any questions about the minutes or comments? And all in favor? Aye. Motion passes. And so then let's move to the November letting. Um, Albert, please come to the podium. Thank you. So, good morning, Chairman Abel, Deputy Commissioner, members of the board. I'm here to present the project the department is proposing to advertise for the November 2022 letting. So, before we present the November 2022 letting, here are the FY 2023 results so far. We have led a total of 59 projects. This chart shows the number of projects by improvement type. The value of these 59 projects is approximately $421.2 million through the September 2022 bid awards, and all are GDOT let. This chart shows the dollar amount distribution by improvement type with maintenance, bridge, and road projects making up the bulk of these types. Here are the results of the September 2022 letting. Of the 29 GDOT let contracts presented to the board, 28 were awarded and one was rejected. Now I'm going to discuss the projects in the November 2022 letting. We have a total of 36 projects, 35 of which are GDOT let and one is locally let. The next three slides list the 33 non-TIA projects arranged by congressional district. So as you can see with this slide, we are letting a variety of projects throughout the state to address bridge capacity enhancement, bridge maintenance, and safety issues. So as you probably noticed in the previous slides, 24 of our projects are maintenance focused. We propose to let a variety of maintenance projects, including resurfacing of roadways, slab repair and replacement, and bridge maintenance. These projects are a great example of our continued commitment to maintaining our existing infrastructure and why Georgia's roads are consistently rated as some of the best in the nation. 
This first highlighted project will patch and replace concrete slabs on I-75 from north of State Route 96 to about a mile south of Sardis Church Road for a length of 11 miles. This section last received concrete rehab work back in 2016, which was seven years ago, and is an excellent example of our continued commitment to maintain our existing infrastructure. This project will replace the structurally deficient bridge on Bass Road over the Norfolk Southern Railroad tracks. The existing bridge was constructed in 1938, 84 years ago. And here's a ground view of that bridge to be replaced. This next project will replace the structurally deficient bridge on Shallowford Bridge Road over the Tacoa River. The existing bridge was constructed in 1918, 104 years ago. So here's a ground view of that bridge to be replaced. As a point of interest, this historic um, truss bridge will remain in place and ownership of the truss bridge will transfer to Fannin County after the new bridge is built. This next project will construct a single lane roundabout at the intersection of State Route 42 and State Route 87. This roundabout will improve operational efficiency by removing the current starting and stopping conditions um, at the intersection. This roundabout will also improve safety. This project will replace the structurally deficient bridge on Brown Road over Swamp Creek. The existing bridge was constructed in 1958, 64 years ago. And obviously, here's a ground view of that bridge to be replaced. <clears throat> this final highlighted project will resurface State Route 1, which is also US 27, from Stevens Road in Polk County to State Route 746 in Floyd County for 8.69 miles. This section was last repaved in 2003, which is 19 years ago, and is another example of our commitment to maintaining our existing infrastructure. Now we'll talk about the TIA project. Thank you, Alan. Good morning, Chairman, members of the board. Um, I'm here to present the TIA projects for the November letting. We have three projects, all in the heart of Georgia region, uh, three intersection improvements in downtown Jessup. Um, <clears throat> and as a, of a note, these are the last three GDOT LET projects in the heart of Georgia region. So out of 764 projects, these are the, the last three in the 10 year period. So um, that's of a interesting note. Um, <clears throat> we are improving three intersections along US 84, um, West Orange Street, Cherry Street, and West Pine. We will be upgrading the um, traffic signals on all three intersections and improving um, some drainage issues that are along West Cherry. Um, this represents a $2.7 million investment in the TIA Heart of Georgia region, and we will also be resurfacing the roadway in between these intersections. So we have 36 projects proposed for the November 2022 letting. This chart shows the distribution by improvement types. The estimate of the project in the November 2022 letting is approximately $149.7 million. This chart shows the dollar amount distribution by improvement type. I now ask for your consideration for approval of the proposed projects presented for the November 2022 letting. Thank you, Albert. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve the November letting. So moved. Sure. Are there any questions for Mr. Shelby? Hearing none, let's vote then. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you so much, Albert. And Matt Markham uh, from the Office of Planning will now present revisions to the construction work program. Matt? Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm pleased to come before you this morning to present um, proposed revisions to the construction work program. Um, as usual, I have two sets of uh, revisions. One's coming before you for review. Um, that will be for action next month. Um, there's one project this time you can see for review um, in Clark County, Congressional District 10. And then these um, projects that I'm coming before you now, uh, there are six projects. Um, all culvert, drainage improvement, um, one bridge replacement in Bryant County, 
and a slope repair project. These came before you last month for review. Uh, they're all additions to the program. Um, and if there are no questions, um, ask for your favorable consideration. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'll entertain a motion for approval to the revisions to the construction work program. So moved. A second. Was there a second? second Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Markham? All in favor? Uh, Any opposed? And the motion passes. Thank you, Matt. Well, we have arrived at the commissioner's report. In this case, it's going to be Deputy Commissioner Brad Saxon. Thank you, Brad. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Obviously, uh, here today in the commissioner's place, as you all are aware, left yesterday afternoon after committee meetings to attend the AASHTO conference. So. Um, it started here today. As usual, we'll start with collections. As you know, the uh, excise portion of the motor fuel sales tax remains suspended. So totals for September, collections were 11.35 million. Fiscal year to date, 56.23 million. And that's $502.2 million less than fiscal year 22 at this time. Moving on to employment data, uh, regular full-time staff headcount for September, 3,699. We hired 103 employees in September and separated 53. So that is a plus 50 gain in the month of September to our headcount, which is something that has not happened in a very long time. So I'd like to say that's a product of a lot of hard work of our HR staff, communications, the districts, um, by holding our first virtual job fairs through the Indeed platform, uh, targeting maintenance entry level positions. And that's a big num big part of that number of 103 are those maintenance positions. Next week, we're hosting another one, virtual job fair, but expand expanding it to include entry level positions in construction inspection, survey technicians, traffic signal technicians, and mechanics. So hopefully that will help drive more folks um, the communications piece that goes with that of uh, telling what the department has to offer as a career here and what we do to make things better in the state of Georgia. So very proud the headcount has went up this month. So uh, professional services procurement report um, for engineering design right away contracts. There were 182 total contracts awarded with a value of $97.4 million. In fiscal year to date, there have been 556 total contracts awarded, valued at $311.2 million. Now, as always, I'd like to highlight some of the projects that opened the traffic in September. The first project, Congressional District 3, G GDOT District 3, Fayette County. The project consisted of the construction of a bridge and approaches on Ebenezer Church Road over Whitewater Creek. The contractor was C.W. Matthews. It opened the traffic September the 29th. The total GDOT investment for the project was $5.7 million. Next project, also in Congressional District 3, GDOT District 3, Coweta County. Project consisted of 11.64 miles of milling, plant mix resurfacing on State Route 34 from north of Clark Street to the Fayette County line. The contractor was E.R. Snell. The project opened the traffic on September 30th on schedule, not early, not late, on the completion date of September 30th. That's called on schedule, right? Exactly on schedule. So total investment, uh, $7.9 million. The next project in Congressional District 2, GDOT District 4, Early County. The project consisted of 9.16 miles of milling, plant mix resurfacing, and shoulder rehab on State Route 273 from east of State Route 370 to the Miller County line. The contractor was Oxford Construction Company. It opened the traffic on September the 14th in a total GDOT investment of $2.5 million. And the final project I want to highlight today, Congressional Districts 5 and 13, Fulton County, GDOT District 7. The project consisted of 5.69 miles of milling and plant mix resurfacing on State Route 279 
from the Fayette County line to south of Herschel Road. The contractor was E.R. Snell. It opened the traffic September 20th, 2022, well ahead of the scheduled completion date of January 31st. Now, as usual, we'd like to go through some updates, achievements and recognitions of the department, what's been going on here for the last month since we last met. And a small project we have going on, you may have heard a little bit about. Uh, work on Transform 285-400 uh, is continuing. The project's more than 70% complete at this point is beginning to move in its final phases. On October the 8th, the contractor closed one eastbound lane between Roswell and Ashford Dunwoody Roads on 285, which is a necessary move to help facilitate the demolition and reconstruction of three original 285 bridges at Glen, Glen Ridge Drive, State Route 400, and Peachtree Dunwoody Road. The closure of one westbound lane for the same reason is scheduled to begin this Saturday. The lane closures anticipated to be in effect for at least eight months. Three lanes in each direction will remain open during the daytime hours with the potential for additional overnight lane closures to further reduce available travel lanes. The bridges being replaced are all more than 50 years old. Replacing them now as part of the larger transform project is actually less impactful than coming back a few, few years later after the completion of the interchange and disrupting traffic again to do the work. This section of 285 carries approximately 240,000 vehicles a day. Obviously reducing 285 to three lanes causes great concern due to the possibility of extreme congestion and major delays. So several efforts were undertaken to mitigate potential congestion and help minimize the impact on the traveling public. The impacts have been reduced, have been mitigated some by delaying this work, the closures of the lanes, until the new collector to distributor lanes and the new on and off ramps around the project were open to traffic, which created additional capacity for motorists heading to local destinations. In addition, messaging. Messaging is very important when you have a major undertaking like this. And the communication teams personally contacted all of our trusted transportation and traffic reporters to make sure this was front page news and that we could reach as many of the traveling public as possible. We certainly appreciate the Atlanta media in helping us get this word out very importantly. Our communications team also conducted a workshop in advance of the eastbound closure for communications personnel with the affected municipalities and other stakeholders in the corridor to help them better understand the closures, learn about the communication tools GDOT had created to help them communicate the news with their own constituents and to ask any questions on the, what we were doing. The session was well received. There were more than 30 communication stakeholders in attendance. We've also maintained a heavy presence on our own social media channels with the message. We've also posted warnings about possible delays on changeable message signs throughout Metro so that motorists who may not otherwise be aware, the folks who may be passing through and happen up on this are aware of the closures and can respond in real time, alter their routes using their favorite wayfinding app. In addition, frequent hero patrols through the corridor have been implemented to help ensure even quicker response to clear travel lanes if and when an incident should occur. And the project team and traffic ops is working with Waze, Google, and other wayfinding app platforms to ensure the right information is conveyed to motorists. The team also created a series of videos to help motorists know what to expect and how to plan ahead. Let's take a look at one of those videos. There's always a little bit of pain before you get the full benefit. I'm Marlo Clowers, and I'm the principal in charge for the Transform 285-400 project. It's a massive construction effort. The first phase will close the inside lanes on eastbound and westbound 285 between Ashford Dunwoody and Roswell Road. The purpose of that closure is to begin uh, the bridge demolition and reconstruction for the 285 bridges over Glen Ridge and 400 in Peachtree Dunwood. We can see the progress being made, all the bridges and the changes, you know, we're closer to the end when we get there. Once it starts, phase one is anticipated to take four months to complete. Phase two is also anticipated to take four months to complete, and so that's a total of eight months. We're building an interchange on top of an existing interchange and trying to keep traffic moving. 
it is a congested site. It's going to get messier until people figure out just where they're going. So really pay attention to where you are. The good news is that while the lane reductions are in place, all the new connector lanes that have been constructed along 285 will be open to traffic. And what that does is it takes you off of 285 earlier and being able to get to the ramps, either 400 or the other city streets, Roswell, Glen Ridge, um, Peachtree Dunwoody, Ashford Dunwoody. We're asking the public to, um, if at all possible, avoid 285. It would be good for you to find another way to work, adjust your work time, you know, come through sooner or later, um, or go around. Use your wayfinding app, Waze and um, Georgia 511. It's, it's rough. I mean, if you're going to close lanes, then you definitely have to really everybody have to put on a patient hat and, and, and let them do their thing. So please, please, please put your phones away, put them down. That text and that call is not that important. Pay attention to where you're going and slow down going through this job site. That's the main thing, just drive for yourself and others. I'm sure we can't all get helicopters and fly over it. We have to just deal with it together and, and get through it as together. Please remain patient. All jobs come to an end. And some final comments on Transform. The TMC, including an outpost at a project office, they continue to monitor the traffic conditions. But at least for now, the good news is the expected profound delays have not materialized as of yet. So we'll continue to keep eyes and keep ears on the situation and provide updates in the coming months as necessary. Oop, I'd already clicked. Hurricane Ian preparedness. As you know, three weeks ago, part of Florida coast was devastated by Hurricane Ian. While early storms predicted a major impact to Georgia, the effects of the storm here turned out to be minimal and mostly concentrated on the coast. But with a high level of unpredictability, the department took all the necessary steps to make sure the state was prepared. So if you recall, early on, the track moved it over time. At one point, it was going to come straight up the middle of Georgia. So as we're making decisions on how are we going to respond, every district has the capability of producing what we call strike teams. Usually we ask for three initially from each district of 15 to 20 people and equipment that can respond to wherever we need to go. Um, so when you're talking about a track that's straight up the spine is what I refer to as a stay at home event because we don't know what we're gonna get. So you look at path and you look at intensity. The intensity is where can we stay or where do we need to move people out of harm's way. So obviously the intensities were going to be lower in that situation. So not knowing what we had, the first plan is we'll just stay put. And then as it kept moving further and further and further to the east, even the folks on the coast, you know, it wasn't intense enough that we even had to evacuate any of our forces out of the coastal areas. Um, but it being as unpredictable as it is, it was a nor'easter ahead of it. But to let you know our districts were prepared. As I said, those strike teams of 15 to 20, you can see on the slide, there's an excavator on a trailer, uh, loaders, anything you can think of that we can push trees with. Um, I've stood before this board in the past on, on occasions after Hurricane Matthew as a district engineer. The limiting factor to our response was that our ability to move our equipment. I can say we are more agile than ever and that we, we can respond to anything that comes our way these days. We can move a tremendous amount of people and equipment to where we need it. And the fact that all the other districts loaded, fueled up, ready to go, knowing exactly what we need to do, it's, it's amazing where we have come in the, in the realm of preparedness. But a little on the event itself, the other pictures there, Sydney Lanier Bridge uh, over the Brunswick River, that's the bottom two pictures there. You can see the bridge in the background, the one on the left. It was temporarily closed due to high winds. Uh, there was a nor'easter ahead of it, and don't ask me which storm, what in, was it? I don't remember which name storm it was, the other one to come up off the coast. Done the same thing. Um, we actually closed the bridge before the hurricane ever got here because the nor'easter was was a bigger influence than, than the winds of the storm at the time, than the storm going along. So it was closed for a period of time. Also, we closed the Houlihan Bridge. It's a swing span bridge in Fort Wentworth over the Savannah River uh, to maritime traffic just because it was going to be unsafe for them to be there. That's in coordination with the Coast Guard, but it remained over to vehicular traffic. 
We also prepared for evacuees. Uh, obviously, a lot of folks moving out of the harm's way. So welcome centers and rest areas in South Central and Coastal Georgia in districts two, three, four, and five were on 24 hour operation schedule. You know, usually we don't have staff there 24 hours, but in these situations we do staff those up, custodial services, et cetera, uh, due to anticipated motorist traffic for the evacuation. Additionally, all projects requiring lane closures along 16, I-16, I-75, and I-95 south of Atlanta were halted to ease potential congestion along those evacuation routes. So obviously, you know, we're no, we're no stranger to the threat of hurricanes, but we were fortunate, you know, not to have had uh, been severely affected this time. But I do, again, want to thank our folks you know, who prepare for these things. We have plans, we, we prepare, we meet just like now. Um, just got text yesterday uh, setting up our winter weather preparedness meeting. Um, there's already been equipment inspections and things going on for winter weather. We do the same for hurricane season as well. There's a lot that goes into that. And uh, those folks to be ready to roll, those strike teams, everything ready and to know if we call and say, we need you to go to wherever then they're gonna be on the road and respond. So um, just wanna say thank you to them, but finish up on the hurricane would of course, on behalf of the department, offer our condolences to all our neighbors who've been adversely impacted by the storm. You know, those are tremendous force, you know, you know forces and devastation that are having to be dealt with in our neighboring states, so. Moving along to 2022, statewide air cargo study. Earlier this month, the Intermodal Division released its 2022 statewide air cargo study that provides a comprehensive review of the air cargo industry in Georgia. The study was conducted from July of 2021 to September of 2022 and was designed to identify air cargo activity to determine if new facilities or improvements are needed and to estimate costs associated with the identified improvement needs. I'd like to highlight some of the relevant facts about air cargo in Georgia drawn from the study, and I thought these were really interesting. $30 billion in commodities arrive and depart Georgia by air each year. Domestically, goods with a total annual value of almost $3 billion are transported by air to and from Georgia. Internationally, that total rises to $27 billion. Top commodities by value include electronics, motor vehicle parts, pharmaceuticals, machinery, and transport equipment. Seven airports in Georgia have scheduled air cargo service ranging from international cargo airports like Hartsfield-Jackson to smaller airports that support integrated express carriers such as DHL, FedEx, and UPS. Air cargo tonnage for airports with scheduled service in Albany, Columbus, Savannah, Statesboro, and Swainsboro is forecasted to grow at an annual growth rate of 2.8%, nearly doubling the annual cargo tonnage from 34,810 metric tons in 2019 to 62,170 metric tons in 2040. Air cargo is critical to many of the industries that conduct business in Georgia, including automotive, pharmaceutical, medical suppliers, to name a few. There's a huge demand, and this study is a key piece in helping us develop a strategy to meet Georgia's growing air cargo needs. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the US DOT marked October as National Pedestrian Safety Month. National Pedestrian Safety Month was established to celebrate the right of everyone to walk safely and reminds drivers of their responsibility to stay alert for pedestrians, cyclists, and other, other vulnerable road users. This is especially timely because pedestrian injuries and deaths have risen to alarming new levels since 2020. GDOT is following USDOT's lead as part of our overall commitment to helping ensure safety for all users. This month, the department doubled down on our ongoing relationship with the Governor's Office of Highway Safety in a joint messaging campaign promoting safer practices to help ensure the safety of pedestrians. To help draw attention to this, our own hero manager, Jason Josie, pictured right there on the slide, participated in the Governor's Office of Highway Safety press conference at the Capitol on October 11th, highlighting the importance of safe behaviors, whether on foot or behind the wheel. 
Jason's remarks focused on hero patrols and the types of behaviors to avoid on Georgia highways. An ongoing concern is that of preventable fatalities of pedestrians on our interstate highways. By pedestrians, we mean individuals on the interstate, whether they're outside a stalled vehicle or wrecked vehicle, trying to cross the interstate for some reason or for any other reason for that fact matter. People on the side of the interstate or outside their vehicles are much worse danger than they even realize. You know, and that's, and for a reason, that's why it's illegal for pedestrians to be on our interstate facilities. To remind Georgia citizens of the facts, GDOT and Governor's Office of Highway Safety work with our valued partners at the Georgia Association of Broadcasters to create a 30 second public service announcement, highlighting the dangers of being on foot on interstates. The PSA is currently playing on member local TV stations statewide. Let's see the video. The interstate is no place to have car trouble. If your vehicle breaks down, try to get to the shoulder of the road and turn on your hazard light. Then call 511 and a GDOT champ or hero unit will be sent to help. Be sure to stay in your car if it is safe to do so. Getting out of your vehicle is even more dangerous. That is why Georgia law prohibits pedestrians on interstate highways. If you break down on an interstate, call 511. Of course, you know, just another effort, you know, we can't leave any stone unturned when it comes to trying to save lives. So we appreciate Georgia Association of Broadcasters for helping us get that word out. And we were just talking about Hero, but also want to provide some positive feedback that we received through our customer service portal on the GDOT website um, about a motorist called in or actually went to the website uh, to report about their interaction with a CHAMP operator in GDOT District 1. And I'd like to read what the uh, motorist sent us. I did not get the name of the CHAMP operator who came out to change my tire tonight, but he was a lifesaver. I had called my insurance provider's road assist without luck another person who did not show up for two hours, and another service who was going to charge me $250 to change my flat. Your operator was quick, professional, knowledgeable, and courteous. Plus, it was free. A big thank you to CHAMP and to Georgia DOT. Literally the best customer service I've received lately from the beginning of my call to completed tire change. Kudos and thanks again. I mean, what a nice reminder of the impact of CHAMP and HERO programs have on our state. These programs often are our first and best resource to keep traffic moving safely and efficiently in Georgia and provide a valued service when most motorists are often truly in need. Both the HERO and CHAMP operators are tremendously valuable to the department and we like to take every opportunity to highlight their good work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That concludes my report. Thank you, Brad. Um, are there any questions? That is my understanding, yes. Sir. Any other questions? Um, yeah, Brad, you know, when, when you and, and in other months the commissioner gives us reports, it, it, it's, you know, very prideful to sit here and, and hear all the, the wonderful things um, that GDOT is doing. I want to, you know, call out the, the Transform project, the 285 project, you know, what you have done, what, what Scott and the Department of Communications have done, I think has set the expectation that things are going to be so awful, hell on wheels, literally, right? That, that anything is better than that, and I was particularly fond of the reference to Game of Cones, except um, hopefully no beheadings. Um, but I think it's, it, it, you know, we should have one more shout out to Marlo Clowers, the, what's her title, principal in, in charge of, uh, of that project. Marlo has been in the thick of this project for years, absolutely years, and, and as the GDOT board member representing the, the district that includes that project, I've gotten uncountable number of calls from constituents um, related to that project. None of them like that champ um, <laughs> message, let, let me tell you. Um, and, and I direct them all to Marla. Um, and, and, and Marla has just been terrific and, and you know, just want to just give a huge kudos for, for the eventual success of that project, so thanks. Great, thank you. Thank you, sir.
Okay, so we're down to the board committee reports. So, um, Tim Golden, Mr. Chairman, will you give us the reports on the statewide transportation planning strategic planning committee? Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, statewide transportation planning strategic planning committee uh, met yesterday. We convened uh, at 2:48. Board members present included myself, Ann Purcell, Dennis McIntyre, Kevin Abel, Robert Brown, Johnny Floyd, Stacy Key, and Greg Morris. First order of business, Andy Torrey uh, presented an outstanding report, I might add, on the branch of rural planning, provided an update on GDOT's transportation alternatives program known as TA or TAP, which held the most successful call for projects and programs, the program's history. The TA program is a set aside from the Federal Surface Transportation Block Grant, which GDOT administers as a competitive grant to local governments and other entities in rural and small urban areas for non-roadway infrastructure projects such as bike paths, and trails, and pedestrian improvements. For the fiscal year 23 cycle, GDOT received 116 total submissions totaling over $61 million. The presentation covered background on the program, GDOT activities, including outreach efforts and call results, and next steps for GDOT as the fiscal 23 process closes. Uh, there were no committee actions taken, and I adjourned the meeting at 3.04, Mr. Chairman, and that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will give the committee report for the Committee of the Whole. The Committee of the Whole convened on October 19th, 22, at 3.05 p.m. Board members present included Kevin Abel, Rob Brown, Ann Purcell, Johnny Floyd, Dennis McIntyre, Stacey Key, and Greg Morris. And uh, John Hibbert made a presentation to the Committee of the Whole on the Eastern Transportation Coalition. Uh, formerly known as the I-95 Corridor Coalition, it began 25 years ago as a coalition of northeastern states and has expanded southward over its existence. The coalition focuses its efforts primarily on operational or quickly developed responses to member needs. It has programs focused on transportation systems management and operations, freight, and innovation. It conducts several nationally known trained program, training programs, including the Operations Academy. Georgia DOT has been an active participant as a coalition member. Our commissioner has served as its executive board chair. No actions were taken during this committee, and there being no further business, uh, Chairman Abel, that's me, adjourned the meeting at 3.29 p.m., and this concludes my report. So let's move on to new business. Is there any new business to be brought before the board today? None? Okay, well then, I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you all.